Hi, everyone. Welcome and good evening. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Claire, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm pleased to introduce this virtual event with Elena Kunis presenting her new book, How to Sell a Poison, The Rise, Fall, and Toxic Return of DDT. She'll be in conversation tonight with Carrie Arsenault. Through virtual events like tonight's, Harvard Bookstore continues to bring authors and their work to our community and our ever-growing digital community. Thank you for joining us tonight in support of our authors and the incredible staff of booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. We sincerely appreciate your support now and always. Our events calendar is filling up both with virtual and what can, in what continues to be a very exciting development as far as I'm concerned, in-person events as well after a couple of years now. Um, our calendar appears on our website at harvard.com slash events, where you can also sign up for our email newsletters and uh, browse our shelves from home. After the introduction, I will also be dropping a link in the chat to order How to Sell a Poison. Your purchases make this virtual author series possible and now more than ever support the future of a landmark independent bookstore. Uh, this evening's event will include some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, you can go to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. The event also has closed captioning available and depending on the version of Zoom you're using, you may need to enable the captions yourself by clicking on the closed caption live transcript button, also on, which is also on your screen. Uh, and finally, as you may have experienced in virtual gatherings over the past you know, couple of years, um, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them quickly. And we thank you for your patience and understanding. Elena Konis is a writer and historian who focuses on medicine, public health, and the environment. In particular, her work looks at scientific controversies, science denial, and the public understanding of science. She directs Berkeley's public journalism program, and her work has been recognized by the National Endowment for the Humanities, the NIH, and the Science History Institute. You may be familiar with her critically acclaimed debut, Vaccine Nation, America's Changing Relationship with Immunization. Tonight, she'll be chatting with Carrie Arsenault, noted writer, editor, and critic. She's the book editor at Orion and contributing editor for Lit Hub. And you may have read her work in the Boston Globe, Airmail, and Freeman's. She's the author of the best-selling and prize-winning Milltown, Reckoning with What Remains. So we approach Earth Day and the 60th anniversary of Rachel Carson's landmark book on DDT. You might be forgiven for thinking that the use of that pesticide is old news. In her terrific new book, How to Sell a Poison, Elena not only interrogates the traditional history of DDT, but also shows how it reemerged in the late 20th century with a new PR spin and public health polish. And it couldn't be more relevant today. As she writes in her introduction, it's a story of how science becomes the turf on which we do battle over differences of gender, race, economic power, and more without ever admitting as much. It's a story all told that shows why we fight about science and why science has the power to divide us. A starred review in Kirkus notes, it's an insightful, timely work. And Publishers Weekly says, Conis's account is impressively researched and her narrative carefully constructed. This is a worthy contribution to environmental history. Uh, and so now I'm pleased to turn things over to tonight's speakers. Um, Elena and Carrie, the uh, podium is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank and you. I'm so lucky to be here with Elena. I, I've been wanting to get my hands on this book for months and months, and I got my hands on it, and now I have my hands on her. <laughs> um, <laughs> I wish we're just going to start. Elena's going to just give her brief uh, summary for those who are not familiar with this book or who haven't gotten their hands on it yet, um, what your book is kind of about in a few sentences. Sure. Absolutely. And first, let me just say thank you to you, Carrie. It's such an honor to be in conversation with you, such an incredible author and somebody whose work I admire so much. And a thanks to Harvard Bookstore, too, for bringing us together in conversation. And I think Claire gave a pretty good overview of what the book's about, but I will kind of put um, a little bit of a different spin on it. I see this book as a kind of chemical whodunit, a book that sort of sets out on a quest to figure out exactly what the truth is about a notorious chemical, DDT. This is a chemical that if you've heard of it, you know it's a pesticide, you know perhaps that we used it abundantly in the Second World War, and perhaps you know that Rachel Carson wrote about it in Silent Spring and that not long after that we banned its use in this country and continued to fight about it even after the ban. Um, DDT's story as I saw it was this really interesting way 
to understand how we change our minds about science. And so for me, really what the book was about was a way to explore and ask this question, how is it that we can decide one thing is scientifically true in one moment, get to another moment, decide that something else entirely, almost the opposite thing is true, and then correct again in the future. I know we'll be talking about all of this, but in a nutshell, that's what this book was about for me. And so much more. Sorry, I just had to turn my speaker off. There were sirens going by. Um, yeah, this book, um, let's see, you wrote, there was something I wanted to quote first before, before we go into my questions, but on page, it, I just saw this right before we got on page 145, Irma West, she worked for, was it the California Department of Health? Yeah, exactly. And she said, quote, and it's something you just kind of spoke of. So when historians of future generations write of our era, they will note wryly how much of our technical capability was devoted to producing commodities inevitably destined to contaminate our environment, which is basically, <laughs> she, 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 she guessed what you were about to do. So you did do that. And so I guess my, I guess my first question is, I wonder, I, I wonder if you could just really briefly summarize why DDT was so or is so nefarious for the people that don't know or how that history has gotten lost. Yeah, thank you for asking that question. I think this is a really good place to start. So here's a chemical that was used in the Second World War because it killed bugs. And the reason why people were so excited about it back in the 1940s was that it killed bugs without, it seemed, without killing people. And the reason why this was important was because we were using insect killers before that. We were spraying them on our orchards and cornfields and you name it. And a lot of them were, they, they were based on things that we now recognize as poisons, chemicals um, like lead, arsenic, copper. And we used them because they were effective at killing bugs. But we also knew that if any of it remained on crops, it was not just bad for the environment, it was bad for us. And there were um, instances of people being poisoned to death, literally, by simply eating too many apples in a row. So DDT seemed like a less toxic way to kill bugs, but the problem was it wasn't toxic in the short term. The other problem was it built up in living beings, and it did so by collecting in their fat, being stored up in their fat which meant that in food chains and concentrated up the food chain and in people, it had the potential to stick around in their bodies for a long, long time. Um, later, much later than the 1940s, we really figured out what exactly it was doing in the body. Um, one of the things that it was doing was mimicking a hormone and this is part of the harm that it caused. We can yeah. say more about that later. Yeah, I mean, it, it causes a lot of harm, but I, I, yeah, I just wanted to get a baseline so that people can understand that don't understand. There's probably a lot of people on here, and I know a few people on this call that do understand that. Um, and I, I was also, you know, I'm always stunned too by a couple things about that. I mean, you did a couple choice statistics, and one I pulled out just so people can know is in, there was one plant in 1947 that ran seven days a week and churned out 2.5 million pounds of DDT a month and discharged more than two two Olympic sized pools of waste into the land every day that's just one plant in one instance mm -hmm. and it also i was also getting sort of irritated and annoyed to to think about and and i i know this in my own book that um science science was always looking at one chemical at, at a time for dosage and how how much a body can bear rather than doses of multiple chemicals over the years the centuries. Um, I think it was Biskind. Was it Morton Biskind? Is that his last? Yeah, yeah. He said, how many simultaneously insults can the human body take? Yeah. Anyway, um, where, where is all that DDT now? <laughs> Ooh, that's a really good question. And I'd love to just go back for a minute and yeah, talk about any part of that. Yeah. Um, so you brought up Morton Biskind, who is this physician in the 1950s who Actually, even before that, in the 1940s, he starts noticing that lots of his patients are coming in with a strange combination of symptoms, and he's just baffled by it. And other doctors that he's in touch with are noticing the same thing. 
Anyway, long story short, he comes to suspect pesticide exposure and particularly DDT exposure. Um, and as he starts asking all of his sick patients, they all end up telling him, yeah, I, I, my dry cleaner uses DDT or they spray it in the kitchen at the hotel where I work or you know, I use it on my drapes and on my mattress at home. Um, and Biskin kind of hones in on DDT because at the time it's one of the most well-known of the new post-war synthetic chemicals, chemicals that we were making in the lab. But what's so interesting and related to what you were talking about, Carrie, is that this is just one of thousands of chemicals that are entering our lives, not just our environment, our lives, our bodies at the same moment in time. And we don't know how they're interacting. And Biskind, as he starts talking to his patients and learning how many of them are exposed to DDT, and then he starts looking further, he's like, well, wait a second, there are all these other chemicals too, and we don't even know what they do. And some of them, I'll say one of the ones that I came across that really shocked me was a, a post-war pesticide called TEP, T-E-P. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, which was, you know, a, a whole bunch of these pesticides were related to nerve gases developed as chemical weapons during the war. DDT was from a different class, but a whole bunch of these chemicals were based on, on this other technology, TEP among them. It was so poisonous that literally if you got a splash of it on your skin as an adult, you would be, you'd be dead within minutes. Um, and there were these cases of poisonings that I came across in health department records where um, the health departments were puzzling over kids who had been like making mud pies with things that they found in the backyard or just like playing with a spray or something and then ended up literally just convulsing and dead within minutes. And it's incredibly tragic. It's also incredibly troubling that those things were sent onto the market. But, you know, yeah. when we talk about, yeah, the fact that one, we don't know how these things interacted. Two, we were kind of so enthusiastic. We put so many of them out there without, in some cases, really worrying about the most fundamental aspects of toxicity. You just alluded to a few things, or one big thing in your book that I should point out um, that, that is really important and really different in your book. Um, I mean, this is this this is kind of the story behind the story of DDT. So Elena just talked about a few different sort of stories. We talked about Biskind and children, and there's all there's a lot of these stories with different people in it. Stories we've not read yet, and narratives of people um, and their stories that have been sort of subsumed by the long shadow of Rachel Carson, who who for those who don't know published the book because there is a younger generation that does not know who she is, who published the book Silent Spring in 1962, which was a critique of uh, reckless DDT use and industry's toxic relationship with the natural world packaged for a broader audience. Um, so this story behind the story, um, why, it, why and why now did you decide to tell this story about DDT? That's a good question. And <laughs> the truth is that I actually thought about telling this story almost 20 years ago, more than 15 years ago. And if it's all right, I'll just share a sort of personal yeah. anecdote about why, why DDT. You know, I was born in the 1970s and I grew up on Long Island in the 1980s. And it was a moment in which we were, you know, we were learning about saving the whales. We were learning about saving the osprey. We were learning about toxic waste. And in fact, my elementary school was closed because um, it was situated on a former industrial site that was causing things like explosions in people's um, basements. And people were just frantic and worried that as kids, we were being exposed to something in the air and the environment. So they shut down our school. But the osprey, I had a story that really kind of stuck with me. The osprey built their nests on the either the highest tree or the top of these poles that wildlife biologists had put across Eastern Long Island to kind of encourage the osprey to come back. And I knew that they had um, disappeared. The story that I heard was that they had disappeared in part because of DDT. I didn't exactly know what the connection was, but I knew the chemical was to blame. I had a friend whose mom um, loved the Joni Mitchell song, Big Yellow Taxi, which has lyrics about, you know, farmer, farmer, <laughs> give me the birds and the bees and I 
forgetting the exact line now, but you know, leave out the DDT, please. And so I knew of it as a really toxic chemical. Mm. Fast forward, I kind of grew up in this moment in which DDT was a known toxic chemical. Now fast forward to the early 2000s and I was a student in public health, a graduate student in public health out here in California. And I was at a conference on global health and one of the sessions was about malaria. And I sat in kind of curious to learn more about why malaria um, was increasing in certain parts of the world, including in particular at the time, Sub-Saharan Africa. And at the kind of Q&A part of the panel, one of the panelists said, you know, what we really need to do to solve the malaria problem is bring back DDT. And I thought, oh, this person's saying something really provocative. Holy moly, what are people in the audience going to say? And nobody said anything. <laughs> people just wow. kind of nodded and said, oh, yeah, we need to bring back DDT. And I think this was around 2001, 2002. And then all of a sudden, I started noticing it in the New York Times and um, on the evening news, journalists that I admired saying, we need to bring back DDT. And I realized something had changed. There was something that mm. was for so long known to be a toxic chemical that somehow had been reassessed. And it seemed like the conversation had happened somewhere off screen. <laughs> and I was curious to know what that conversation was and, and why this chemical had a, a changing, if not an entirely new reputation. So it stuck mm. with me. And as I started to look into it, the answer was really, really complicated. Um, and the more I looked into it, it just, it grew into a book <laughs> in short. Yeah. I mean, toxics like DDT and toxics like it are, are, are complicated and the stories are never simple because they involve like, like, like you write about so many characters, but also just the, the back and forth between, um, science of fact and, and, and lies and evidence mm -hmm. and hearsay and all that stuff it gets it gets very complicated and you get into that quite a bit um but speaking of stories we we talked about this earlier when we spoke briefly earlier today but um this is Carson makes I'm not going to stick on Rachel Carson too long um but I, I want to talk about why she doesn't merely make a long appearance in your book um she 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 does appear briefly um but she remains deeply engraved in American memory when so many other people like that are in your book contributed to DDT's demise. What, what do you think her story contained that these other stories did not or, or vice versa? Um, That's really interesting. So actually to talk about that, I kind of want to go back a step and pick up um, with that kind of moment in the early 2000s when I was starting to think yeah. that there is a book here because one of the things that I did um, that convinced me that there was more to this story was I had found out about a growing collection of documents that um, was being compiled by UCSF, University of California, San Francisco, which had um, gotten the, the documents released in discovery during the suits filed against the tobacco companies in the 1990s. And after the settlement with the tobacco companies, all of these documents showing what the tobacco companies knew and when they knew it were released. And then UCSF was digitizing them and putting them online. So private memos from tobacco industry meetings from like the 40s, 50s, 60s, et cetera. Huh. Something made me plug DDT into their early search engine. And I found that the tobacco industry was looking at the chemical in the 40s and 50s. And they were taking notes on it at the time, um, noting things like, oh, it actually makes the tobacco sweeter or yeah. slower or, you know, things like this. I was like, oh, that's interesting. Of course, it makes <laughs> sense that they would look at what pesticides were doing to their crop. But then not long after, I plugged DDT into that same search engine. And then I found something else entirely, um, which I'm just going to mention briefly now so I can get back to Rachel Carson. But I found that they were really interested in stopping the kind of, well, they were interested in the 1960s in stopping farmers from using DDT. In short, they were interested in the same thing that Rachel Carson was interested in, mm. that there was like an overuse of DDT in the 1960s. By the 2000s, the tobacco industry decides to support a campaign to bring back DDT. 
but we'll come back there in a minute because let's stick with Rachel. Carson. Oh, no, I think that, that's a question I have too. We can go back to Carson anytime, but that is a question I have. I mean, that whole tobacco, I was really surprised to read that and, and, and frankly, just kind of freaked out that, 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 you know, here, here, you know, um, we hear about risk factors, right, for lung cancer. And it's always like, do you smoke cigarettes? That's always a pro you know, when you go to the doctors even now, the first thing they ask you is, is do you smoke? And, and you know, it's always putting the blame on, on people themselves or ca calling that a risk factor. But, but if your tobacco itself is being treated with DDT, you know, where, who's, who's, where's the burden there? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was really kind of really, really um, frustrated to learn that. <laughs> yeah, and I was pretty shocked to learn it, to be honest. So here's this chemical, it's the 1940s, people are using it with abandon. Uh, the tobacco industry is like, oh, curious. Um, okay, it does these things to our crop. Then in the 1950s in the US, there's this growing concern about chronic diseases, which are starting to outpace infectious diseases. And one of the most um, prominent ones is cancer. And we enter into this moment where we're really approaching a sort of national panic about cancer in the 1950s. Tobacco is starting to get some attention as a cause of cancer. And interestingly, smokers start writing to the, to the tobacco companies and they say, well, hold on, do you know how many poisons are sprayed on your crop, maybe that's what's causing cancer, not the cigarettes themselves. And so the tobacco companies like take note of this, they save these letters and they say, hey, let's look into that. Um, let's jump to the 1960s now. At this point, European nations are getting more conservative about pesticide use and they start inching toward curbing the use of certain pesticides, DDT among them. And then the US tobacco industry sees this and says, oh no, if we can't grow DDT, if we can't grow tobacco without DDT, we're going to lose our European markets. And those were like a third of their, their markets. So the tobacco industry then scrambles to start studying all these pesticides to try to figure out exactly what's on their crop. Um, and also what scientists know about how toxic these chemicals are in the background, <laughs> now now oh. Rachel Carson is in the background right. <laughs> writing right. Silent Spring, right? right? And this is part of the answer of how her work and her book for me started to kind of fall into the background because I realized there were all these other things happening and she sort of stepped into this conversation not even knowing that it was going on. Mm -hmm. And so the tobacco industry is by the, you know, after Silent Spring is published and they see this public backlash kind of well up against DDT. And Silent Spring was about other chemicals too, but sure. it really yeah. featured DDT in a big way. And the tobacco industry is meanwhile telling its growers, please stop using so much DDT. It's asking the USDA if it can help stop growers, tobacco growers from using so much of the chemical. Um, Carson's book ends up sort of having this snowball effect to these. Yeah. Um, there were already people who were opposing DDT when she started working on her book. We mentioned one of them, Morton Biskind earlier, and he's one of many people. And then her book in also coincides with a movement among um, the United Farm Workers to start targeting. Which you write about in depth, which I love. I mean, more than I've read about it before. Uh, yeah, I mean, there hasn't been terribly much. I mean, there has been some scholarship about this and some writing about it, but um, also it's kind of taken a backseat to accounts about Rachel Carson and Silent Spring. So I saw all of this other stuff happening at the same time, and it sort of explained to me in a large way why her book was so effective in floated yeah. to the top. Yeah. I mean, there were, there were scientists were concerned about its safety as early as what, 37, 1937, maybe well, uh, the research I saw anyway, I don't know if that's what you concluded. about, about DDT or about, about DDT on human health. And then 1945, 46, 47, the New Yorker, the new Republic, the New York times magazine, all respectively ran stories about DDT. This is in the forties. Yeah. Um, uh, so the concerns were already there and yeah, all these things swirling around and things behind closed doors and things 
in the public view, both. And it was, I just found it so interesting that her story is the one that seemed to have, has stuck in American memory and imagination. And I, I wonder if that's and something you just said before this was, I wonder if it had something to do with the birds, like the osprey really mm -hmm. affected you. And for her, it was robins and that, you know, birds activate imagination too. And I yeah. wonder if that helped, I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, I've given some thought to this and I'm so glad that you kind of raised this because it's it's such an interesting question. Why, why Silent Spring? Why Rachel Carson? And why have they had such lasting power? And I think there are a few reasons. I mean, she was a beautiful writer. She was a really effective writer. And I think she tapped with that book. She tapped into something that people were already talking about and worried about and already agitating about in some ways. I think that the other thing is that she... She had fans of her previous books. <laughs> she had a lot of respect right. because of that previous work. And then there were the things that happened after Silent Spring came out. Um, you know, she, she wrote a book that forced us to really focus our attention on pesticides and their toxicity. She forced us to make some policy changes, which we had been inching toward, and then there are these other things. She was a scientist. She was a woman. She wrote a book that like captured our attention, you know, just before the women's movement. And yeah. then she kind of became an important part of post-war American history. I think in part because of her gender, not entirely, but I think right. in part of that, uh, in no. part because of that. Yeah. Good point. Speaking yeah. of speaking of storytelling and environmental storytelling, I want to talk about your title. <laughs> yeah. When I when I as a book critic, when I read, the first thing I think about is the title, and I think it was um, it was so well titled. But and, and and the reason I want to talk about it, everybody, it's how to sell a poison. I want to ask you that: how how did the how were these chemical companies able to sell a poison to the critical mass? I mean, oh. to me, it seems like citizens have the better story. Hey, let's live. Um, where these chemical companies were able to sell a poison. Um, so anyway, I just wonder if you yeah. can talk about that a little, or, 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 or did they sell a poison or is my, is my understanding of the situation overinflated our whole understanding, our history's understanding of what they actually did. Yeah. So one of the really interesting things that I found just early on and people who study this sort of thing or this history for a living know this, but I didn't know when I first started looking into this past was that poison was the accepted term for chemicals that killed bugs <laughs> in the 1910s, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. We called them, we called them poisons and specifically we called them economic poisons. They were poisons. Yeah that protected the economy, poisons that played an economic role. Um, so poisons wasn't, it wasn't a bad word, it was just an honest word at the time. These are things that kill living things and therefore are by definition poisons. And when DDT and other chemicals like it were first rolled onto the market, a lot of the um, regulations that states put into effect forced manufacturers and retailers to put like the skull and crossbones on the label to say like, hey, we got to remind people that this is a poison in part because it was, again, different from the previous generation. It didn't kill you right away. It wouldn't like, you know, right. a, a, even a big dose wouldn't kill you right away. So the starting point was these are poisons. The other starting point was that poisons were just sort of normalized. But what I found so interesting was that as these post-war poisons started to become contested because there were people who said hold on I think they actually are toxic we just don't understand how and we need to take some time to look at it and study it a little more closely as people began to say that mostly like scientists and um, beekeepers some entomologists etc farmers too at the same time the chemical companies found that there was this tremendous enthusiasm for these less poisonous poisons. <laughs> and so they saw that there was a big market for them. And so they, they marketed them as safe and they marketed them not just as safe, but as, as health promoting. Mm. In particular in the 1940s, if you look back at DDT ads from the 40s and, and 50s, you'll see magazine ads that say, 
like, you know, get this DDT infused wallpaper for your child's room to protect them from measles, scarlet fever, polio, like a whole bunch of things that DDT did not prevent at all. Um, but the idea that it was safer than previous poisons just really, really informed these marketing campaigns. And then at the same time, people who were starting to say, let's stop using these poisons found themselves taking in some cases these battles to court yeah. and this is going to bring us back to the title because there was this moment in this court case to take us back to long island although the book really takes place all over the u.s yeah. there are a couple mm -hmm. of scenes on long island yeah and one of them is in the late 1950s where a woman named marjorie spock um, did not want her land sprayed with DDT, even though her county was going to be spraying all trees um, in the area with DDT. And so she ends up taking the case all the way to court and she ends up before a judge who asks her and her attorney to stop using the word poison. And he strikes it from the record and says, let's call these insecticides. They kill insects. They're not poisons. And the word poison, I realized, just starts to disappear. And it's not that this judge had an outsized role. You know, the mm. manufacturers, too, realized we don't want these called poisons. Let's call them pesticides. It's a kind of more anodyne. Well, yeah, that, that perversion of, or perversion, I'll call it, uh, perversion of language is, is problematic. When, when we talk about these things, you turn it into insecticide, it sounds like it's something that's going to help keep everything clean and pure, right? Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to poison, which is going to kill you. You know, that's that's a big difference. And I I, I came across that when, um, when I was researching tire derived fuels, which sounds really bad. You burn tires for fuel, but now they call it special fuels. So the word tire doesn't even exist in that term. So like, that, yeah, that perversion of language can, and that's what advertising is about. Uh, co-opting the language perversion of language using the language and that's another whole story in and of itself um the story of the language that is used in in these in in describing these poisons yeah, As well, yeah go ahead if you want to say yeah, something i mean i think that they're like you know the, these language shifts are intentional because they're designed to get us to change how we think and yeah. they really do i mean they're effective especially when repeated over and over and over again yeah. you lose sight of the original meaning um, and the original way of thinking about it and you adopt a new way of thinking well there was there was one point in the book even on a larger marketing sort of scale was um i don't know if you or somebody in your book said it ddt well not you didn't say it you you were you were repeating it but you said ddt was critical to establishing american superiority i mean that was a that was a big marketing thing too not that it was marketed but i mean yeah. can you talk about that just for a second like what yeah. that means absolutely uh, absolutely and this is related to why DDT was so familiar to the American public. So why it was familiar both um, helped it be sold and also helped it end up being taken down by, you know, to put it simply, Silent Spring and everything that followed. Um, but yeah, the, the fact that DDT was used in the Second World War in a way that gave that you know gave the allies credit for victory <laughs> was right. critical to establishing this idea that here was this chemical that illustrated American scientific prowess and achievement. So to give some examples, there, DDT wasn't developed by Americans. It was developed by a Swiss chemical company and the Swiss actually decided to share it. They shared it with the Germans, they shared it with the British, they shared it with the Americans during the Second World War. Um, the Germans and the Nazis decided they had a really hard time assessing DDT's toxicity. So they were like, let's not use it. We can't figure out fast enough if it's really toxic or not, let's drop it. Um, the British and the Americans sped ahead using it and the Americans in particular decided to start spraying it everywhere that, that their troops were fighting, where they were in the presence of mosquitoes that spread diseases like malaria, dengue, yellow fever. Um, they sprayed it in mess halls to keep them free of things like cockroaches and flies. They, sp they started spraying it on mattresses to prevent bed bugs and scabies and lice. I mean, the 
the Americans just went all in on DDT and they fed stories, the US Army fed stories to the news media here about how DDT was helping the Americans help the allies win the war. And our newspapers carried stories that showed bombers that were rigged with these enormous spray tanks and they would just coat entire islands in the South Pacific with DDT and say, and this is what helped us win in the Pacific. Wow. Yeah, so this was again this story that that helped the U.S. kind of establish itself as as a world power coming out of the Second World War, saying you know this is one of the many ways in which our science was superior and helped us win and kind of come out ahead. Yeah, it's almost like the the race to the moon kind of thing a little bit. I just want to remind people, if you have questions, you can put them in now. I can check them. Like if there's something we're talking about that you have to really get your question out, do not be shy. Just put it in there. Um, and and Or you can save that to the end. I just want to remind you. Um, I also, um, oh, I have so many, because I, I have a million questions and I just want to make sure I give you your fair share um, of asking. I... I know I just asked you about your title, but I also want to talk about your subtitle, which I know these sound like crazy things, but it's, it, I think about them a lot. Um, it was the rise and fall and toxic return of DDT. It's, it's essentially the narrative arc of your book, um, but not necessarily arc of most books because most books sort of end with a conclusion of some kind, um, except maybe like horror movies where, you know, Freddy Cougar or some demon keeps getting killed and then he returns and you're like, why isn't that guy just dying? Um, <laughs> this is what I kind of was thinking about while I was reading your book. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and if you think about it, it really kind of is like a little horror story in that sense. Um, and I wonder if you could just sort of talk about that, that structure and how you did it in three parts. I mean, it started as the rise, fall and return. And you talked about it a little bit, you've been seeing yeah. things, uh, uh um, in the news and people raising their hands say, let's bring back DDT. But like, but I guess I, I, I want you to talk about the ending, but not talk about the ending. I guess what I want to know is, is did banning DDT really make a difference? That's one of the questions, the part, part one of the question, did banning it make a difference? Um, and then what of the chemicals we're using instead or have it been invented since? So it's like, like a million part question. <laughs> That is like a really pick whatever question. you just yeah. say whatever you want basically you can yeah. talk about anything yeah so let me say a couple of things um before I get to did banning DDT make a difference I, I want to come back to your question about the title because yeah this is a story in three acts and in that third act we have this push to bring back DDT um and this is one of those moments where the story gets really interesting because this push to bring it back is funded by the tobacco companies in the late 90s, early 2000s. It's spearheaded by um, free market promoters and conservative think tanks who see an opportunity in the first two acts of DDT's story. Mm. Right around the turn of the millennium, these folks say, look at this very interesting thing about the story of DDT. We banned it back in 1972 because we said it was too toxic to wildlife and that it was probably causing cancer in people. But by the late 1990s, the scientific studies looking at DDTs linked to cancer were really contested. There were studies that said, yes, it seems linked. Yeah. And there were studies that said, no, it does not seem linked. And so these conservative think tanks said, one thing we can say is DDT protects people from malaria because it kills mosquitoes very, very effectively. And what we can say is that by banning it, liberals who supported the ban have actually put people in poor countries the world over at higher or greater risk of malaria just to serve their own interests. And they were like this, by promoting this story and saying it's time to bring back DDT, we can really paint environmentalists specifically and liberals more generally in a really negative light. Mm -hmm. um, the tobacco industries were interested in this because it was a way, just very simply put, although there's more detail on this that I can go into, but very simply put, the tobacco companies said, well, this is helpful because this is a good way to, to 
spread the idea that regulation is not always good, that more regulation doesn't always make people healthier, that it can have downsides um, and unintended consequences. So that's, that's part of like the story of DDT's toxic return is that there were these forces behind the scenes saying, bring it back. And they weren't entirely honest about it. They were able to get away with this because at the same time, there were scientists and um, public health leaders who actually thought, hey, there is no better thing than DDT. Maybe we use, need to use it really conservatively in places where there's nothing that's yeah. a better option to, to prevent malaria. So that's one part of the toxic. Actually, I want to I want to clarify because somebody asked in the chat, and you're okay. just talking about it now. They said who banned DDT, and I do want to clarify that it is still used. It's it was banned the U.S. government to produce and use it, right? Maybe you could speak a little more clearly. Yeah, yeah. So this is before you go to the next like part. <laughs> regulatory answer is that when we ban pesticides, we restrict their allowed uses. And so back in 1972, when the then new US EPA banned DDT, um, it did so by saying it could no longer be used in all of these ways that it was being used. And it created an exception saying, but in the case of a public health emergency, it can still be used. The ban was that I'm talking about is the US's ban. Um, other nations elsewhere banned it. Some of them also included exceptions. And around the year 2000, there was a global treaty called the Persistent Organic Pollutants Convention, the POPs Convention, that identified 12 persistent toxic chemicals, DDT among them, that um, hundred more than 150 nations around the world agreed to phase out over time and DDT was one of them um, but it was the one chemical on the list that was targeted by the convention that also had a public health exception and that that public health exception was fought for mostly again by health advocates and malaria scientists who said um, we need this in places where malaria is particularly um, entrenched. But the idea was also circulated and promoted by some of these conservative groups and think tanks, again, funded by the tobacco industry, which in its documents made clear that they were really interested in a story that would distract people from the harms of smoking and focus their attention on malaria as a health problem worth more attention than, than cancer related to tobacco use. Mm. So holy moly, this is like a tangled knot, a really, really, really complicated web. And there's still more to the story. Of yeah, I was going to say, so then like what, what the part second, the sort of part two of my question, or maybe we didn't even get through the whole of part one, as you can see, everybody, it is, it is complex to even answer the question simply because they're so entangled. Um, um, but I was asking about like, about the chemicals that we, we've invented or are using since instead of DDT or instead of the 12 yeah. Other whatever. Yeah. So I like to think about this question in a pretty big context because in the moment when DDT was introduced, as I mentioned at the beginning of our conversation, it was seen as less toxic than the chemicals we were using before it. Then we ban it and we ban it because of several reasons. It persists in wildlife. It persists in the environment. We had by the 1970s, good evidence that linked it to the decline of several species of birds. We mentioned robins before, osprey, it affected different birds in different ways. Um, and we also had preliminary evidence linking it to effects in humans, especially cancer. Although the evidence was really, really preliminary in the 1970s, um, but we banned it. And then we banned other chemicals like it. And then we replaced them with things that were toxic in an entirely different way. Um, the, the DDT is uh, among a class of pesticides called the organochlorines. And instead we started leaning more heavily on the organophosphate pesticides, which were more toxic to in the short term. And so we started actually seeing the toxicity shift more toward farmers and farm workers, people applying these in the fields. 
then go jump ahead another couple of decades and we start shifting away from the organophosphates in particular some of them start to be targeted for ban and now we're on yet another class of pesticides the neonicotinoids and these have similar effects on wildlife, bees especially, um, that scientists are just starting to try to unravel and understand. So mm -hmm. we keep solving the previous problem with new problems. And importantly, all throughout all of this, DDT is kind of the, the sort of scapegoat that makes us think that we've solved our worst pesticide problems. But after the ban, pesticide use only increases yeah. and has only continued to increase since the 1970s. So we haven't lessened our reliance. If anything, we've done the opposite. And it really, then you have to look to go back to Silent Spring at that book in an entirely different light. What did it accomplish for us? What did because, it accomplish, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and then it, it it goes back to the like that is the true horror story. It just keeps coming back and coming back, or some version of it keeps coming back, like newly demented version. And yeah. and it, <laughs> and it and and that's that's what you said. That's the subtitle. That's why I asked it. This is the rise, fall, and toxic return. It's returning and returning. And yeah. these chemicals, these these chemicals do, and they stay in the body, as you mentioned right at the top of the talk. They stay in our bodies. They don't go away because we keep accumulating them as well. They go away, but then we keep accumulating anyway. And our environment. Um, and I'll just I'll just add yeah, one more thing about that. Yeah, no, as I was as I was writing the book, um, this incredible report came out. Well, first it came out in a scientific journal, and then the LA Times reported on it. Um, and this was the story of the discovery of of discarded, long ago discarded DDT and DDT manufacturing related waste that currently rests at the, the, the sediment, in the sediment at the, in the Pacific Ocean off the coast of Southern California. And um, these expeditions that have been carried out over the last couple of years while I was finishing writing began to quantify exactly how much DDT was dumped in barrels and also probably just just kind of sent overboard whole cloth back in the 1950s and 60s, possibly even into the 1970s, that still remains out there in ocean sediment and is still making its way through marine life food chains. I should, I should say the the journalist that wrote about that is on this on this in is watching our event. I don't know if you oh, saw her. Hey, Rosanna hey. is here uh, uh, from hi, LA. Rosanna. So glad you're here. <laughs> I was, it, it makes me think of a joke if a historian uh, a memoirist and a journalist walked into a room that's the three of us anyway let's, let's hope it's a bar yeah let's hope it's a, or a bar yeah, yeah. <laughs> um maybe we'll do that someday um i want to make sure there's somebody has a question too that um uh, i want to make sure we get in because we are we're the 10 minutes away or 10 or 15 minutes but we can keep going um Lara Tassara asks, I'm, I'm so enjoying this conversation. Yay, thanks, Lara. And I'm really looking forward to reading the book. Elena, you mentioned how the science around DDT became a ground on which gender difference was contested or constructed, which is super fascinating. Could you say more about how gender is brought into your narrative? Yeah, thank you so much for that question, Lara. So I'm gonna answer that in two ways, one in kind of a broad way, and then second with a, a, just one brief illustrative anecdote. Um, DDT has been written about before and to sort of overgeneralize and oversimplify, it's been written about many, many times in book form, especially by men. <laughs> and the accounts, so many of them focus so heavily on the contributions of largely, if not entirely, male scientists um, and um, politicians and other actors. And one thing that struck me was that Rachel Carson was this sort of singular woman in this larger conversation. But as I started to look back at the very beginning of the story of DDT, I noticed that there were critiques about the chemical that were coming from a bunch of people and women were represented in this group to a greater extent than I had ever realized reading the existing scholarship on the chemical. Um, one of the things that I noticed in one of these early instances that I came across was that there was, and this is a chapter early in my book, there was a small community, and this is just one example, in southeastern Georgia in the mid-1940s 
that became convinced that DDT was killing their baby chicks, killing their birds, um, contaminating their crops, and eventually became convinced that it was making them sick. And they tried to launch a movement. They tried to start a movement, a health movement, an anti-DDT movement in the late 1940s. Most of the leaders in this movement were women. And the records of their exchanges with several different of Georgia's state departments, the health department, the agriculture department, they even took it to the aviation department, um, were all on record in the Georgia archives. And what I noticed in the exchanges was that the heads, the scientific experts that these women activists were looking to get help from were all men. And behind the women's backs, they would say, look, these people are just hysterical. They're yeah. over anxious. This is all in their heads. But to each other, they would admit, we actually have no idea how toxic this is. Actually, we need to look into this and understand it. They would write to the companies manufacturing these chemicals and say, can you please fill us in? We really need to understand the toxicity. But that is not at all the story they shared with these, these women. Instead, they dismiss their concerns as fully fictitious and imaginary. So what I saw taking place, and this is just one little example of something that I saw repeated over and over and over again um, throughout this chemicals history. If, if you know the story of Rachel Carson, you're familiar with one of the most well-known examples, which is how one of the chemical industry's modes of attack on her was to attack her for her gender, to call her a spinster and to say that because she was childless, you know, in her 50s, her, her mind didn't work right and her ideas weren't worth you know, our attention and had no merit. And this, this way of using gender-based attacks to kind of conceal what we do or don't know about science just struck me as all too common throughout this story. So that's one brief or two brief ways of, of answering that question of yours. Thanks for asking that, Lara. No, that's great. That's great. I'm glad you got to talk about that. Um, I mean, we also talked earlier too, the sort of the emergence of these women in your book, they, it started, the book starts with mostly like kind of men populating the book. And as, as sort of the decades go by, the emergence of women and women scientists become, they, they emerge and they become a little more on solid footing, even though they're still being sort of pointed out like hysterical woman, which has been, it's been going on for centuries. It's still happening now, um, in fact, right? I, I would say. Yeah. Um, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And actually, just because you pointed me to the list of people in the audience, I noticed that <laughs> the woman scientist who is really key in um, identifying those barrels of DDT on the Pacific floor is, is also here with us. So hi, Veronica, so glad you're here with us. Um, inhabiting a very different moment from the moment in which lots of the women that I, women scientists that I write about in the book inhabited. And yeah, I, you know, earlier, Carrie, you had mentioned Irma West, who was a physician um, who worked for the California Health Department and was documenting pesticide poisonings in California and actually was feeding information to Rachel Carson. You also mentioned Marjorie Spock. And I talked about how she was, she was trying to farm organically on Long Island in the 1950s and um, ended up going to court to try to preserve her as she saw her right to do so. And she too ended up being a major source of information and scientific connections for Rachel Carson. Um, and these were women who, who made like tremendous strides in bringing the toxicity of DDT and other poisons to light and who, are, are almost invisible in these histories. Yeah, you know? I, I think I was going to say one last comment and then you can say whatever, if anybody has any questions, put them now or forever hold your peace. But his, his, to me, maybe you could argue this, but history is made by those who tell it really. And as a historian, you probably know that to be true in some ways. And here you chose these, these ordinary people, these women. Um, is that... <laughs> Is that something you often see in history books? Um, I think and more so. More yeah. so. Yeah. yeah, and I think it was something that was really important to me. I know this is important to you too, Carrie. I, I, I like trying to understand how just ordinary people think about science and counter science and try to make understand make sense of science's role 
in their lives and try to parse its, you know, the risks and the benefits of new technologies. And it, it struck me that we give so much credit to the environmental movement for bringing public attention to DDT's problems and for securing the ban in the 1970s. And movements are supposedly made of ordinary people, right? Like, like all of us. And, yeah. you know, even looking at that movement, I began to realize didn't go far enough. Like there were so many other people who were trying to make sense of what this chemical and other chemicals meant in their lives, trying to understand why they had access to some information and not other kinds of information. Um, one of the stories that I tell, and this will be kind of the last thing that I, I point to, is the story of the town in Northeastern Alabama, Triana, where um, the mayor of this, this was at the time 98% black town, he discovered that his residence had among the highest DDT levels in the world ever documented. This is the late 1970s after DDT was banned. And he embarked on a quest to kind of figure out how it had happened and to get it cleaned up. And to tell you the truth, the cleanup is happening to this day. The EPA just filed its sixth five-year report on that cleanup um, just last year. So there's yeah, there's a lot of those communities are, are cleaning up, like we talked about earlier too, St. Louis, Michigan, whose Robins have some of the highest DDT um, amounts in their, in their little bodies. Yeah, them. yeah, and just ordinary people are seeing those birds in their backyard catching fish yeah. and hoping that they still don't have high levels. There's yeah. one question that popped up. It's going to be going to be a tricky one. <laughs> um, Harvey Gould, um, thanks for your question. He wants to know, and you you wrote about this a little bit. Um, what should we do about malaria? <laughs> yeah, so what should we do about malaria? Yeah, well, interestingly, there are very, very, very few places that are using DDT for malaria. Um, there are other chemicals that are used in combination with it or instead of it. I wrote briefly about um, one of the scientists who actually is here in Berkeley as well, um, Brenda Eskenazi, who has spent years, almost decades now, looking at um, what is it that DDT is doing to people in places where it's still in use. And they, they have found effects on, for instance, children's development um, in the short term. And this is in addition to the long-term connections to certain forms of cancer that we know about. And I do wanna point out that DDT is not one of the strongest carcinogens out there or one of the strongest endocrine disruptors, um, hormone mimics, we haven't even talked about that, um, but it is a known one. So the question is in places where malaria is still an incredibly important public health problem, we know that there are multiple ways of controlling it and chemical controls are one, other environmental controls are another, economic development generally is another really important one too. So I think that there is no magic bullet solution. I think back in the 40s, 50s, even into the 60s, we thought DDT was a magic bullet solution for malaria. Um, and in some places it was incredibly effective in far more places it, it wasn't. The mosquitoes kind of weren't well targeted or by it or um, they evolved and became resistant to it. And we ended up having to use more and different chemicals anyway. So the short answer is it's complicated, but it's not one thing. And I'm not a malaria expert. I'll leave that answer to the malaria experts, but. <laughs> That's a good answer. <laughs> is there, are there any last, um, last things you'd like to say about your book that you'd like to tell our lovely um, audience here? No, yeah, you know, thanks so much for that, Carrie. I think we've we've talked so much about it and we've a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've covered a lot. And I'm just grateful to those of you guys who were in the audience for joining us today. And I really look forward to talking pe to people about it. I I wrote it as a book that I hope raises more questions than it answers. And so I'm I'm really eager and to it does. And it it raises a lot of questions for me. I learned I learned a ton. It's highly, highly readable and and fascinating. I mean I, I I there's tons of notes in here. I I highly recommend you get this book. 
um, you won't be sorry. Um, Thank you, Carrie. I appreciate it. And here comes Claire back from Harvard. Thank you both. That was just a really wonderful, interesting, thought-provoking um, conversation. And we were so glad that you could share it here with us. Um, and I also want to say thank you to everyone out there um, for spending your evening with us, spending your Marathon Monday with us. Um, <laughs> you can learn more about the book and purchase it on our website, harbor.com, or via the link in the chat. I also put a link to Carrie's recent book as well. Um, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore in Cambridge, Massachusetts, have a wonderful night. Keep reading and please, please be well. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Good night, Elena. Good night, Carrie.